and a renowned suit of money no, no. to make his home in obscure Here's some garlic bread I'm joined to eat while well, listening to the desires of ages. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. In the sunlight of his father's countenance, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. His mind was active and penetrating, with a thoughtfulness and wisdom beyond his years. Yet his character was beautiful in his entry. The powers of mind and body developed gradually, in keeping with the laws of childhood. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb, and a truthfulness that would never sacrifice integrity. In principle, firm as a rock, his life revealed the grace of unselfish courtesy. With deep earnestness, the mother of Jesus watched the unfolding of his powers and beheld the impress of perfection upon his character. With delight, she sought to encourage that bright, receptive mind. Through the Holy Spirit, she received wisdom to cooperate with heavenly agencies in the development of this child who could claim only God as his father. From the earliest times, the faithful in Israel had given much care to the education of the youth. The Lord had directed that even from babyhood, the child should be taught of his goodness and his greatness, especially as revealed in his law and shown in the history of Israel. Song and prayer and lessons from the scriptures were to be adapted to the opening mind. Fathers and mothers, yeah, I sure children, love God, is an God of his I thank the Lord. And as they received the principles of the Lord to the heart, the image of God was traced on mind and soul. Much of the teaching was oral, but the youth also learned to read the Hebrew writings, and the parchment rolls of the Old Testament scriptures were opened to their study. In the days of Christ, the town or city that did not provide for the religious instruction of the young was regarded as under the curse of God. Yet the teaching had become formal. Tradition had, in a great degree, supplanted the scriptures. True education would lead the youth to seek the Lord. If Yo, like Jesus, he had a but tough the child. Their attention to matters of ceremony. Jesus' child was, was tough. Material that was worthless his, to his, his brothers kind of kind of like outcasts. I mean, his, his life was tough. No Jesus' life was tough. Absorbed in the round of externals, the students found no quiet hours to spend with God. They did not hear his voice speaking to the heart. In their search after knowledge, they turned away from the source of wisdom. The great essentials of the service of God were neglected. The principles of the law were obscured. That which was regarded as superior education was the greatest hindrance to real development. Under the training of the rabbis, the powers of the youth were repressed. Their minds became cramped and narrow. The child Jesus did not receive instruction in the synagogue schools. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, he learned of heavenly things. The very words which he himself had spoken to Moses for Israel, he was now taught at his mother's knee. As he advanced from childhood to youth, he did not seek the schools of the rabbis. He needed not the education to be obtained from such sources, for God was his instructor. The question asked during the Savior's ministry, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Does not indicate that Jesus was unable to read, but merely that he had not received a rabbinical education. Since he gained a knowledge, as we may do, his intimate acquaintance with the Scripture shows how diligently his early years were given to the study of God's Word, and spread out before him was the great library of God's created works. He who had made all things studied the lessons which his own hand had written in earth and sea and sky. Apart from the unholy ways of the world, he gathered stores of scientific knowledge from nature. He studied the life of plants and animals and the life of man. From his earliest years, he was possessed of one purpose. He lived to bless others. For this, he found resources in nature. New ideas of ways and means flashed into his mind as he studied plant life and animal life. Continually, he was seeking to draw from things seen, illustrations by which to present the living oracles of God. The parables by which during his ministry he loved to teach his lessons of truth show how open his spirit was to the influences of nature and how he had gathered the spiritual teaching from the surroundings of his daily life. Thus to Jesus, the significance yeah, of the word and the words of God was unfolded. This. As he was trying to understand the reason of things. Can you listen Heavily to the, his attendance in the culture of Sire of Ages? Was his. The life the story of the Lord Jesus He was Jesus constantly Christ. growing in spiritual grace and knowledge of truth. Every child may gain knowledge as Jesus did. As we try to become acquainted with our Heavenly Father through his word, angels will draw near. Our minds will be strengthened, our characters will be elevated and refined. We shall become more like our Savior. And as we behold the beautiful and grand in nature, our affections go out after God. While the spirit is awed, the soul is invigorated by coming in contact with the infinite through his works. Communion with God through prayer develops the mental and moral faculties and the spiritual power strengthen as we cultivate thoughts upon spiritual things. The life of Jesus was a life in harmony with God. While he was a child, he thought and spoke as a child. But no trace of sin marred the image of God within him. Yet he was not exempt from temptation. The inhabitants of Nazareth were proverbial for their wickedness. The low estimate in which they were generally held is shown by Nathaniel's question, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus was placed where his character would be tested. It was necessary for him to be constantly on guard in order to preserve his purity. He was subject to all the conflicts which we have to meet, that he might be an example to us in childhood, youth, and manhood. Satan was unwearied in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. From his earliest years, Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels, yet his life was one long struggle against the powers of darkness. That they should be upon the earth one life free from the defilement of evil was an offense and a perplexity to the prince of darkness. He left no means untried to ensnare Jesus. No child of humanity will ever be called to live a holy life amid so fierce a conflict with temptation, as was our Savior. The parents of Jesus were poor and dependent upon their daily toil. He was familiar with poverty, self-denial, and privation. This experience was a safeguard to him. In his industrious life, there were no idle moments to invite temptation. No aimless hours opened the way for corrupting associations. So far as possible, he closed the door to the tempter. Neither gain nor pleasure, applause nor censure, could induce him to consent to a wrong act. He was wise to discern evil and strong to resist it. 
Christ was the only sinless one who has ever dwelt on the earth. Yet, for nearly 30 years he lived among the wicked inhabitants of Nazareth. This fact is a rebuke to those who think themselves dependent upon place, fortune, or prosperity in order to live a blameless life. Temptation, poverty, adversity is the very discipline needed to develop purity and firmness. Jesus lived in a peasant's home and faithfully and cheerfully acted his part in bearing the burdens of the household. He had been the commander of heaven, and angels had delighted to fulfill his word. Now he was a willing servant, a loving, obedient son. He learned a trade and with his own hands worked in a carpenter's shop with Joseph. In the simple garb of a common laborer, he walked the streets of the little town, going to and returning from his humble work. He did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or to lighten his toil. As Jesus worked in childhood and youth, mind and body were developed. He did not use his physical powers recklessly, but in such a way as to keep them in health. That he I used my physical everyone. powers recklessly. He was not going to be effective, even in the handling of his tools. He now. was perfect as a workman, as he was perfect in character. I mean, By his own Jesus was more strong than I would be. That People back then were smart and intelligent now. That such labor is honorable. The exercise that teaches the hands to be useful and trains the young to bear their share of life's burdens gives physical strength and develops every That's faculty. True. All should find something to do that will be beneficial to themselves and helpful to others. God appointed work is a blessing, and only the diligent worker finds the true glory and joy of life. The approval of God rests with loving assurance upon children and youth who cheerfully take their part in the duties of the household, sharing the burdens of father and mother. Such children will go out from the home to be useful members of society. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus was an earnest and constant worker. He expected much, therefore he attempted much. After he had ended on his ministry, he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus did not shirk care and responsibility as do many who profess to be his followers. It is because they seek to evade this discipline that so many are weak and inefficient. They may possess precious and amiable traits, but they are nerveless and almost useless when difficulties are to be met or obstacles surmounted. The positiveness and energy, the solidity and strength of character manifested in Christ are to be developed in us through the same discipline that he endured, and the grace that he received is for us. So long as he lived among men, our Savior shared the lot of the poor. He knew by experience their cares and hardships, and he could comfort and encourage all humble workers. Those who have a true conception of the teachings of his life will never feel that a distinction must be made between classes, that the rich are to be honored above the worthy poor. Jesus carried into his labor cheerfulness and tact. It requires much patience and spirituality to bring Bible religion into the home life and into the workshop, to bear the strain of worldly business, and yet keep the eyes single to the glory of God. This is where Christ was a helper. He was never so full of worldly care as to have no time or thought for heavenly things. Often he expressed the gladness of his heart by singing psalms and heavenly songs. Often the dwellers in Nazareth heard his voice raised in praise and thanksgiving to God. He held communion with heaven in song, and as his companions complained of weariness from labor, they were cheered by the sweet melody from his lips. His praise seemed to banish the evil angels and, like incense, fill the place with fragrance. The minds of his hearers were carried away from their earthly exile to the heavenly home. Jesus was the fountain of healing mercy for the world, and through all those secluded years at Nazareth, his life flowed out in currents of sympathy and tenderness. The aged, the sorrowing, and the sin burdened, the children at play in the innocent joy, the little creatures of the groves, the patient beasts of birth, all were happier for his presence. He whose word of power upheld the worlds would stoop to relieve a wounded bird. There was nothing beneath his notice, nothing to which he disdained to minister. Thus, as he grew in wisdom and stature, Jesus increased in favor with God and man. He drew the sympathy of all hearts by showing himself capable of sympathizing with all. The atmosphere of hope and courage that surrounded him made him a blessing in every home. And often, in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he was called upon to read the lesson from the prophets, and the hearts of the hearers thrilled as a new light shone out from the familiar words of the sacred text. Yet, Jesus shunned display. During all the years of his stay in Nazareth, he made no exhibition of his miraculous power. He sought no high position and assumed no titles. His quiet and simple life, and even the silence of the scriptures concerning his early years, teach an important lesson. The more quiet and simple the life of a child, the more free from artificial excitement, and the more in harmony with nature, the more favorable is it to physical and mental vigor, and to spiritual strength. Jesus is our example. There are many who dwell with interest upon the period of his public ministry, while they pass unnoticed the teaching of his early years, but it is in his home life that he is the pattern for all children and youth. The Savior condescended to poverty, that he might teach how closely we, in a humble lot, may walk with God. He lived to please, honor, and glorify his Father in the common things of life. His work began in consecrating the lowly trade of the craftsmen, who toil for their daily bread. He was doing God's service just as much when laboring at the carpenter's bench as when working miracles for the multitude. And every youth who follows Christ's example of faithfulness and obedience in his lowly home may claim those words spoken of him by the Father through the Holy Spirit. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. The Desire of Ages, Chapter 8, Passover Visit. Among the Jews, the twelfth year was the dividing line between childhood and youth. On completing this year, a Hebrew boy was called a son of the law, and also a son of God. He was given special opportunities for religious instruction, and was expected to participate in the sacred feasts and observances. It was in accordance with his custom that Jesus, in his boyhood, made the Passover visit to Jerusalem. Like all devout Israelites, Joseph and Mary went up every year to attend the Passover. And when Jesus had reached the required age, they took him with them. There were three annual feasts. The Desire of Ages, Chapter 9, Days of Conflict. From its earliest years, the Jewish child was surrounded with the requirements of the rabbis. Rigid rules were prescribed for every act, down to the smallest details of life. 
Under the synagogue teaches the youth were instructed in the countless regulations, which as orthodox Israelites they were expected to observe. But Jesus did not interest himself in these matters. From childhood he acted independently of the rabbinical laws. The scriptures of the Old Testament were his constant study, and the words, Thus saith the Lord, were ever upon his lips. As the condition of the people began to open to his mind, he saw that the requirements of society and the requirements of God were in constant collision. Men were departing from the word of God and exalting theories of their own invention. They were observing traditional rites that possessed no virtue. Their service was a mere round of ceremonies. The sacred truths it was designed to teach were hidden from the worshippers. He saw that in their faithless services, they found no peace. They did not know the freedom of spirit that would come to them by serving God in truth. Jesus had come to teach the meaning of the worship of God, and he could not sanction the mingling of human requirements with the divine precepts. He did not attack the precepts or practices of the learned teachers, but when reproved for his own simple habits, he presented the word of God in justification of his conduct. In every gentle and submissive way, Jesus tried to please those with whom he came in contact. Because he was so gentle and unobtrusive, the scribes and elders supposed that he would be easily influenced by their teaching. They urged him to receive the maxims and traditions that had been handed down from the ancient rabbis, but he asked for their authority in holy writ. He would hear every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, but he could not obey the inventions of men. Jesus seemed to know the scriptures from beginning to end, and he presented them in their true import. The rabbis were ashamed to be instructed by a child. They claimed that it was their office to explain the scriptures, and that it was his place to accept their interpretation. They were indignant that he should stand in opposition to their word. They knew that no authority could be found in scripture for their traditions. They realized that in spiritual understanding, Jesus was far in advance of them. Yet they were angry, because he did not obey their dictates. Failing to convince him, they sought Joseph and Mary, and set before them his cause of non-compliance. Thus he suffered rebuke and censure. At a very early age, Jesus had begun to act for himself in the formation of his character, and not even respect and love for his parents could turn him from obedience to God's word. It is written, was his reason for every act that varied from the family customs. But the influence of the rabbis made his life a bitter one. Even in his youth, he had to learn the hard lesson of silence and patient endurance. His brothers, as the sons of Joseph were called, sided with the rabbis. They insisted that the traditions must be heeded as if they were the requirements of God. They even regarded the precepts of men more highly than the word of God. And they were greatly annoyed at the clear penetration of Jesus in distinguishing between the false and the true. His strict obedience to the law of God, they condemned as stubbornness. They were surprised at the knowledge and wisdom he showed in answering the rabbis. They knew that he had not received instruction from the wise men, yet they could not but see that he was an instructor to them. They recognized that his education was of a higher type than their own. For they did not discern that he had access to the tree of life, a source of knowledge of which they were ignorant. Christ was not exclusive, and he had given special offense to the Pharisees by departing in this respect from their rigid rules. He found the domain of religion fenced in by high walls of seclusion as too sacred a matter for everyday life. These walls of partition he overthrew. In his contact with men, he did not ask, What is your creed? To what church do you belong? He exercised his helping power in behalf of all who needed help. Instead of secluding himself in a hermit cell in order to show his heavenly character, he labored earnestly for humanity. He inculcated the principle that Bible religion does not consist in the mortification of the body. He taught that pure and undefiled religion is not meant only for set times and special occasions. At all times and in all places, he manifested a loving interest in men and shed about him the light of a cheerful piety. All this was a rebuke to the Pharisees. It showed that religion does not consist in selfishness and that their morbid devotion to personal interest was far from being true godliness. This had roused their enmity against Jesus so that they tried to enforce his conformity to their regulations. Jesus worked to relieve every case of suffering that he saw. He had little money to give, but he often denied himself of food in order to relieve those who appeared more needy than he. His brothers felt that his influence went far to counteract theirs. He possessed a tact which none of them had or desired to have. When they spoke harshly to poor degraded beings, Jesus sought out these very ones and spoke to them words of encouragement. To those who were in need, he would give a cup of cold water and would quietly place his own meal in their hands. As he relieved their sufferings, the truths he taught were associated with his acts of mercy and were thus riveted in the memory. All this displeased his brothers. Being older than Jesus, they felt that he should be under their dictation. They charged him with thinking himself superior to them and reproved him for setting himself above their teachers and the priests and rulers of the people. Often they threatened and tried to intimidate him, but he passed on, making the scriptures his guide. Jesus loved his brothers and treated them with unfailing kindness, but they were jealous of him and manifested the most decided unbelief and contempt. They could not understand his conduct. Great contradictions presented themselves in Jesus. He was the divine son of God, and yet a helpless child. The creator of the worlds, the earth was his possession, and yet poverty marked his life experience at every step. He possessed a dignity and individuality wholly distinct from earthly pride and assumption. He did not strive for worldly greatness, and in even the lowliest position, he was content. This angered his brothers. They could not account for his constant serenity under trial and deprivation. They did not know that for our sake he had become poor, that we through his poverty might be rich. They could understand the mystery of his mission no more than the friends of Job could understand his humiliation and suffering. Jesus was misunderstood by his brothers because he was not like them. His standard was not their standard. In looking to men, they had turned away from God, and they had not his power in their lives. The forms of religion which they observed could not transform the character. They paid tithe of mint and anise and cumin, but omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. The example of Jesus was to them a continual irritation. 
He hated but one thing in the world, and that was sin. He could not witness a wrong act without pain, which it was impossible to disguise. Between the formalists, whose sanctity of appearance concealed the love of sin, and a character in which zeal for God's glory was always paramount, the contrast was unmistakable. Because the life of Jesus condemned evil, he was opposed both at home and abroad. His unselfishness and integrity were commented on with a sneer. His forbearance and kindness were termed cowardice. Of the bitterness that falls to the lot of humanity, there was no part which Christ did not taste. There were those who tried to cast contempt upon him because of his birth, and even in his childhood he had to meet their scornful looks and evil whisperings. If he had responded by an impatient word or look, if he had conceded to his brothers by even one wrong act, he would have failed of being a perfect example. Thus he would have failed of carrying out the plan for our redemption. Had he even admitted that there could be an excuse for sin, Satan would have triumphed and the world would have been lost. This is why the tempter worked to make his life as trying as possible, that he might be led to sin. But to every temptation he had one answer. It is written. He rarely rebuked any wrongdoing of his brothers, but he had a word of God to speak to them. Often he was accused of cowardice for refusing to unite with them in some forbidden act, but his answer was, it is written, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. There were some who sought his society feeling at peace in his presence, but many avoided him because they were rebuked by his stainless life. Young companions urged him to do as they did. He was bright and cheerful. They enjoyed his presence and welcomed his ready suggestions. But they were impatient at his scruples and pronounced him narrow and straight-laced. Jesus answered, It is written, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto, according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Often he was asked, Why are you bent on being so singular, so different from us all? It is written, he said, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. When questioned why he did not join in the frolics of the youth of Nazareth, he said, It is written, I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies, as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts, and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Often his work was made unnecessarily severe, because he was willing and uncomplaining. Yet he did not fail nor become discouraged. He lived above these difficulties, as if in the light of God's countenance. He did not retaliate when roughly used, but bore insult patiently. Again and again he was asked, Why do you submit to such despiteful usage, even from your brothers? It is written, he said, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days, and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the table of thine heart, so shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. From the time when the parents of Jesus found him in the temple, his course of action was a mystery to them. He would not enter into controversy, yet his example was a constant lesson. He seemed to be as one who was set apart. His hours of happiness were found when alone with nature and with God. Whenever it was his privilege, he turned aside from the scene of his labor to go into the fields, to meditate in the green valleys, to hold communion with God on the mountainside or amid the trees of the forest. The early morning often found him in some secluded place, meditating, searching the scriptures, or in prayer. From these quiet hours, he would return to his home to take up his duties again and give an example of patient toil. The life of Christ was marked with respect and love for his mother. Mary believed in her heart that the holy child born of her was the long-promised Messiah, yet she dared not express her faith. Throughout his life on earth, she was a partaker in his sufferings. She witnessed with sorrow the trials brought upon him in his childhood and youth. By her vindication of what she knew to be right in his conduct, she herself was brought into trying positions. She looked upon the associations of the home and the mother's tender watch care over her children as of vital importance in the formation of character. The sons and daughters of Joseph knew this, and by appealing to her anxiety, they tried to correct the practices of Jesus according to their standard. Mary often remonstrated with Jesus and urged him to conform to the usages of the rabbis, but he could not be persuaded yeah, to change his habits of contemplating the of God and seeking to alleviate the suffering of men or even of dumb animals. When the priests and teachers required Mary's aid in controlling Jesus, she was trying to be troubled, like Jesus, but peace but came to her heart he as he presented the statements of Scripture upholding Maybe his practices. Maybe you can do it. Anything's At times possible. she wavered between Jesus and his brothers, who did not believe that he was the center of God. Because, but evidence was abundant that his was a divine character. She saw him sacrificing himself for the good of others. Just because his I didn't succeed. Brought a purer atmosphere no, to the home, and his life was as level working succeed. amid the elements of society. <clears throat> Harmless and undefiled, he walked among the Do thoughtless, the rude, the, order, the uncourteous, the amid the unjust publicans, the reckless prodigals, the unrighteous Samaritans, the heathen soldiers, the rough peasants, and the mixed multitude. He spoke a word of sympathy here, and a word there, as he saw men weary, yet compelled to bear heavy burdens. He shared their burdens, and repeated to them the lessons he had learned from nature, of the love, the kindness, the goodness of God. He taught all to look upon themselves as endowed with precious talents, which if rightly employed, would secure for them eternal riches. He weeded all vanity from life, and by his own example taught that every moment of time is fraught with eternal results. That it is to be cherished as a treasure, and to be employed for holy purposes. He passed by no human being as worthless, but sought to apply the saving remedy to every soul. In whatever company he found himself, he presented a lesson that was appropriate to the time and circumstances. He sought to inspire with hope the most rough and unpromising, setting before them the assurance that they might become blameless and harmless, attaining such a character as would make them manifest as the children of God. Often he met those who had drifted under Satan's control, and who had no power to break from his snare. 
To such a one, discouraged, sick, tempted, and fallen, Jesus would speak words of tenderest pity, words that were needed and could be understood. Others he met who were fighting a hand-to-hand -hand battle with the adversary of souls. These he encouraged to persevere, assuring them that they would win, for angels of God were on their side and would give them the victory. Those whom he thus helped were convinced that here was one in whom they could trust with perfect confidence. He would not betray the secrets they poured into his sympathizing ear. Jesus was the healer of the body as well as of the soul. He was interested in every phase of suffering that came under his notice, and to every sufferer he brought relief, his kind words having a soothing balm. None could say that he had worked a miracle, but virtue, the healing power of love, went out from him to the sick and distressed. Thus, in an unobtrusive way, he worked for the people from his very childhood, and this was why, after his public ministry began, so many heard him gladly. Yet, through childhood, youth, and manhood, Jesus walked alone. In his purity and his faithfulness, he trod the winepress alone. And of the people, there was none with him. He carried the awful weight of responsibility for the salvation of men. He knew that unless there was a decided change in the principles and purposes of the human race, all would be lost. <clears throat> this was the burden of his soul. That's the price you pay for being a good and righteous man, for being Filled a good man. Purpose, he carried out the design Choose of life, to do good as a man, should be the light pretty much of alone men. as well. The Desire of Ages, Chapter 10, The Voice in the Wilderness. From among the faithful in Israel, who had long waited for the coming of the Messiah, the forerunner of Christ arose. The age priest Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth were both... The Desire of Ages, Chapter 8, Passover Visit. Among the Jews, the twelfth year, and thus shall you eat it, he said, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. I'm it is the Lord's bit. Passover. At midnight, all the firstborn of the Egyptians were slain. Then the king sent to Israel the message, Rise up, Savior. Wrapped in the contemplation of these scenes, he did not remain beside his parents. He sought to be alone. When the pastoral services were ended, he still lingered in the temple courts, and when the worshippers departed from Jerusalem, he was left behind. In this visit to Jerusalem, the parents of Jesus wished to bring him in connection with the great Jesus teachers of Israel. Was quite a While he was time. obedient in every particular to the word of God, he did not conform to the rabbinical rites and usages. Joseph and Mary hoped that he might be led to reverence the learned rabbis and give more judgment to the movie. But Jesus in the temple had been taught by God. That which he had received, he began at once to impart. This is a very good book. At that day, an apartment connected with the temple was devoted to the same school after the manner of the Christ. schools of the prophets. Here, leading rabbis with their pupils assembled, and hither the child Jesus came. Seating himself at the feet of these grave, learned men, he listened to their instruction. As one seeking for wisdom, he questioned these teachers in regard to the prophecies and to events then taking place that pointed to the advent of the Messiah. Jesus presented himself as one thirsting for a knowledge of God. His questions were suggestive of deep truths which had long been obscured, yet which were vital to the salvation of souls. While showing how narrow and superficial was the wisdom of the wise men, every question put before them a divine lesson and placed the truth in a new aspect. The rabbi spoke of the wonderful elevation which the Messiah's coming would bring to the Jewish nation. But Jesus presented the prophecy of Isaiah and asked them the meaning of those scriptures that pointed to the suffering and death of the Lamb of God. The doctors turned upon him with questions, and they were amazed at his answers. With the humility of a child, he repeated the words of scripture, giving them a depth of meaning that the wise men had not conceived of. If followed, the lines of truth he pointed out would have worked a reformation in the religion of the day. A Last deep interest one. in spiritual things would have been awakened, and when Jesus began his ministry, many would have been prepared to receive him. The rabbis knew that Jesus had not been instructed in their schools, yet his understanding of the prophecies far exceeded theirs. In this thoughtful Galilean boy, they discerned great promise. They desired to gain him as a student, that he might become a teacher in Israel. They wanted to have charge of his education, feeling that a mind so original must be brought under their molding. The words of Jesus had moved their hearts, as they had never before been moved by words from human lips. God was seeking to give light to those leaders in Israel, and he used the only means by which they could be reached. In their pride, they would have scorned to admit that they could receive instruction from anyone. If Jesus had appeared to be trying to teach them, they would have disdained to listen. But they flattered themselves that they were teaching him, or at least testing his knowledge of the scriptures. The youthful modesty and grace of Jesus disarmed their prejudice. Unconsciously, their minds were opened to the word of God, and the Holy Spirit spoke to their hearts. They could not but see that their expectation in regard to the Messiah was not sustained by prophecy, but they would not renounce the theories that had flattered their ambition. They would not admit that they had misapprehended the scriptures they claimed to teach. <clears throat> From one to another passed the inquiry, how hath this youth knowledge, having never learned? The light was shining in darkness, but the darkness apprehended it not. Meanwhile, Joseph and Mary were in great perplexity and distress. In the departure from Jerusalem, they had lost sight of Jesus, and they knew not that he had tarried behind. The country was then densely populated, and the caravans from Galilee were very large. There was much confusion as they left the city. On the way, the pleasure of the rabbis, and they were astonished at his questions and answers. His words should themselves, but had cast the blame upon him. It was natural for the parents of Jesus to look upon him as their own child. He was daily with them. His life in many respects was like that of other children, and it was difficult for them to realize that he was the son of God. They were in danger of failing to appreciate the blessings of the presence of the world's redeemer. The grief of their separation from him and the gentle reproof which his words conveyed were designed to impress them with the sacredness of their trust. In the answer to his father, Jesus showed for the first time that he understood his relation to God. Before his birth, the angel had said to Mary, He shall be great and shall be called the Many Son of the Many blessings. Highest. 